Okay. Word, but... Yes, I found it. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. Uh, today, uh, we welcome Dr. Cesar Rodriguez Sauna to give us the department seminar. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our own professor today. Uh, Cesar uh, graduated from Universidad Nacional Agraria, uh, Agraria in Peru uh, with a bachelor degree in 1991. Then uh, he obtained a master degree from Oregon State University in 1994. He got his PhD degree from University of Riverside, uh, University of California Riverside in 1999. After that, he had uh, three postdoc positions from uh, uh, USDA ERS, Western Cotton Research Lab, and uh, University of Toronto, and Michigan State University. So since 2005, he joined us as assistant professor, then gradually rose to the rank of a full professor. Uh, his study is in chemical ecology, uh, mostly based on the cranberry, blueberry insects. Uh, he's a very uh, productive researcher. He's one of the nationally and internationally well-known entomologists working on chemical ecology. In 2020 alone, he published uh, 16 papers I just counted. So he's really a, a productive researcher and educator. Today, he will share us his um, career experience and hopefully we can get some uh, uh, new insights about his research and about his uh, experience. Thank you, Cesar. Thank you, Cheng Lu. Um, yeah, it's my pleasure like to um, provide kind of like a summary of my journey as a researcher in entomology. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, what I have been doing in the past 20 years. Um, uh, one of my main goals in my uh, career has been to manipulate natural enemies uh, so they can be better in agroecosystems, uh, better in controlling pests. So I'm going to like take you through this journey with me today. So as I, uh, uh, Dr. Wang mentioned, I started uh, 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 as an entomologist with um, an interest in entomology uh, as an undergrad student at the Uni Universidad Nacional Agraria. Uh, back then, there was an, a new invasive pest, um, this white fly, Bemisia tabasi, that had just invaded our country. And um, this um, faculty per, uh, um, member, in the biology department uh, was interested in um, recruiting me as a student to look at parasitism of these white flies in uh, sweet potatoes. So that's what I did as an undergraduate student. Um, that was my, what at Rockers would be a, an honors thesis. So I did um, this uh, work going to uh, sweet potato fields, collecting white flies, um, collecting leaves and then bringing them to the lab, looking for the number of eggs, nymphs, and also whether those nymphs were parasitized or not. So I continued um, this passion in entomology um, here in the US. I, um, early on, uh, after I finished my undergraduate degree, I came to the US to do a, a, a pursue a, a, a master's degree um, at the, um, at Oregon State University. Uh, there I work uh, with um, the, uh, a faculty uh, on biological control who was studying lady beetles. Uh, and my project was to improve uh, lady beetles by selecting them for faster development times to see whether we can uh, select different lines, one that was a slow de uh, developing line and one that was a faster developing line and whether that could improve their efficacy as biological control agents. So then I, I moved to UC Riverside uh, where I a little bit switched uh, uh, to working more on the plant side. Um, I looked at um, 
these uh, specialized oil cells that are present in avocados. And um, my, my major professor was interested, uh, was working in a collaboration with this other faculty um, from the plant science department. Um, and they were interested to, in looking at what is the role of these oil cells in uh, plant defense against herbivores. Uh, so that's where I started working in chemical ecology. I, uh, I worked in collaboration with Jocelyn Miller, a very well renowned uh, chemical ecologist. And uh, we isolated um, the compounds, uh, isolated and identified the compounds uh, that were present in these oil cells that were, um, were having an effect on uh, insects that feed, not just on, on avocados, but also um, the generalist herbivores. But um, during grad school, I became fascinated by um, these um, interactions between plants, the herbivores, and the natural enemies. I was fascinated by the fact that plants could produce these volatiles that um, are used by the natural enemies to find their host or prey. Um, and that was um, something that I wanted to pursue as a, as a career goal. So um, after I finished my PhD, I looked for postdoc positions that would allow me to continue with that line of research. And I was lucky enough that a position open in Arizona, just about that, looking at plant volatiles and their role in um, attracting natural enemies. Um, uh, and this work was done in cotton. So I was trained at that time to collect volatiles from plants and look at their role on insect plant interactions. But I wanted to do something in the field. I wanted to, um, at that time, there were not many studies showing that these interactions were important and the natural conditions and their field conditions. So um, I moved to Toronto to work with Jennifer Taylor to actually show, and I'm going to talk about some of this work here to show how important these interactions are and their uh, natural conditions. And then I came back uh, to the US uh, uh, to do a, a third postdoc uh, looking at volatiles emitted from ash plants and how that affects the behavior of the emerald ash border. That was a short um, postdoc that I did before I joined Rockers. I don't know why it's not, there we go. So here at Rockers, I'm uh, working on blueberries and cranberries, and I'm asking both basic and applied questions. On the basic side, uh, we have been asking, does domestication affect plant defenses against herbivores? And also, does pathogen infection affect plant insect interactions? On the more applied side, we have been asking whether we can use semiochemicals, these chemicals that are used in communication uh, among insects um, with, within insect uh, species, but also with plants, um, in order to manipulate insect behavior and reduce pest populations. So we have been testing attractants and repellents. We have been using these chemicals also in a more, um, in a way to control this pest in mating disruption and also attract and kill and push pull systems. But today, what I'm going to talk to you about is something that I'm very passionate about, uh, which is tritrophic level interactions and uh, how natural enemies use chemicals from plants to find their host. Uh, whether we can exploit those chemicals uh, to control pests and also um, and then, um, finding new food sources and providing food sources for these natural enemies in agroecosystems. So as I mentioned, my, my, my passion is on tritrophic interactions. And these are interactions between the plants, the herbivores that feed on the plants and the natural enemies. Early on, researchers in host plant resistance study the interactions between 
the herbivore and the plants. While researchers in biological control, they study the impact that natural enemies have on those herbivores. But these two methods were viewed as independent strategies to controlling pests. And it wasn't until uh, 40 years ago already that Peter Price and colleagues wrote a seminal paper arguing that theory on insect-plant interactions cannot progress realistically without considering the third trophic level. So since then, there, there have been several studies that have looked into these tritrophic level interactions. However, most of these studies used a single plant species, a single herbivore, and a single species of natural enemies. So early in my career, I asked whether these studies were realistic. I have been also asking, what are the ecological factors that influence these interactions? And more recently, I'm asking if these interactions can be exploited uh, in agricultural systems to enhance biological control. So to start my, my, my presentation, I want to give you a brief summary on plant defenses. Um, as you all know, plants cannot run away from their enemies, but instead they employ several strategies to reduce the number of herbivores and the feeding damage on those plants. Plants produce uh, toxins, antifeedant compounds, and also growth inhibitory compounds that can affect the performance and preference of herbivores on the plants. And some of these are stored in a specialized uh, structures, uh, such as those oil cells that I mentioned in avocados, but also in tomatoes, for example, they have these trichomes where uh, that um, have these granular trichomes that store some of these toxins when the insect walks through the leaves. So these uh, compounds reduce the growth and also decrease the feeding of the herbivores uh, feeding on, uh, on those plants. But in addition, plants also produce volatiles that can attract the natural enemies of those herbivores. So these defenses can be inducible. They can be produced constitutively, uh, but also when the herbivore feeds on the plant, uh, these, pl uh, these compounds can be increased uh, the plants increase their production uh, and thus can be induced after herbivore feeding. One such type of inducible defense are proteinase inhibitors that, as the name indicates, inhibit um, the enzymes that break down proteins in plants and thus will affect the digestibility of the food that the insect is ingesting. For example, I found that the activity of proteinase inhibitors in tomatoes increases more than three times when uh, plants are being fed by caterpillars. And uh, this increase in proteinase inhibitor, inhibitor activity is correlated by a decrease in herbivore performance on those plants. But not all herbivores induce the same response in tomatoes. For example, when, uh, when tomato plants are attacked by aphids, um, tomatoes do not uh, increase the production of proteinase inhibitors. Instead, feeding by uh, aphids um, increases the performance, um, increases the susceptibility of tomatoes to caterpillars. So makes the, the, the plant more susceptible to caterpillar feeding. So not just these direct defenses are inducible, but also the volatiles that are emitted by the plant when they are being fed upon are inducible. So it is known that when herbivores feed on, on the plants, the plant responds by increasing the levels of volatiles that are emitted. For example, um, similar to other studies, I show that caterpillar uh, feeding induces volatile production in cotton plants. This graph, for example, shows you the amount of emissions from cotton plants when being damaged by uh, the beet armyworm, Spodoptera exigua, larvae, and, uh, and, and damaged plants. And as you can see, uh, the plants that are being damaged emit significantly higher 
amounts of these volatiles. But what I was interested early on was whether this volatile response in plants was a specific to the type of herbivore uh, feeding habit. So if you have a plant that is being damaged by herbivores that, for example, caterpillars or uh, uh, content feeding herbivores or flowing feeders, does the plant respond in a similar way? So um, the first two, these uh, caterpillars, uh, the chewing caterpillars and the cell, cell content feeders, they can cause a lot of damage to the plants. So one would expect that they induce more, a stronger resp volatile response in those plants. Whereas flowing feeders are more gentle to uh, when they feed on the plants and they might not induce that many volatiles when uh, feeding on those plants. And this is what I found that yes, there is a specificity on uh, the plant response depending on who's feeding on those plants. I found that uh, the volatile response to chewing herbivores, the caterpillars, and the cell content feeder like like a Hesperus was more similar than compared to a phloem feeder that is more gentle feeder. Although, as you know, uh, these gentle feeders can cause a lot of damage by transmitting uh, diseases like viruses. Uh, this is important, uh, es especially because plants are often attacked by more than one type of herbivore at the same time. So what I, uh, I was one of the first or not the first that documented that when you have multiple feeders, uh, insects that feed simultaneously on the same plant, the plant response is different to when only one herbivore is feeding at a time. And you can see here how cotton responds to dual damage by caterpillars and nymphs compared to when they are just attacked by caterpillars. And what I found was when you have two herbivores, the, the chewing herbivore and the flowing feeder herbivore feeding on the same plant, you have a decrease in the amount of volatiles. And specifically, like I, I found that three volatiles were emitted in lower quantities when you have two herbivores uh, feeding on the plants at the same time. And this can be explained by the fact that these different herbivores induce different responses in, plant, in plants that can be sometimes conflictive. Uh, for in one side, you have caterpillars that induce the jasmonic acid pathway. And this pathway has been linked to the increases in both direct and indirect defenses, the production of uh, uh, increased production of proteinase inhibitor activity and also volatiles. And on the other hand, you have aphids or white flies that increase the, um, activate the salicylic acid pathway. And the activation of this pathway can inhibit the jasmonic acid pathway. So my studies were the first one to document that multiple herbivores can influence the volatile emissions in plants. I also showed that, um, that the number and identity of herbivore species on plants can have an influence on these tritrophic level interactions. I also conducted studies that show that the phenotype of your neighboring plant whether it's induced or not induced, can affect the number of herbivores and natural enemies on the, the focal plants. So it's not just who's feeding on one plant, but also the phenotype of your neighboring plant that can influence these tritrophic interactions. So this brings me to a more recent research to manipulate the natural enemies in agroecosystems using plant volatiles. Uh, due to a stricter um, uh, regulatory um, rules on chemical control, there is an increased interest in ecologically based strategies to manage insect pests. It is well known that uh, crop diversity can promote 
biological control in agroecosystems by providing food and shelter to natural enemies. But these depend on the composition of this surrounded landscape. Thus, increasing diversity within and also around the fields, the, um, these uh, agroecosystems can increase ecosystem services that are provided by the natural enemies. So an expectation is that these natural enemies from these natural or semi-natural habitats will move from these surrounding habitats to the focal crop to reduce the pest populations. However, this might not be the case. And to assist with this process, we can use uh, synthetic plant volatiles that can be placed within your fields to attract the natural enemies from these natural uh, or semi-natural habitats. So um, for the first act, uh, my lab has been studying whether we can manipulate natural enemy behavior using synthetic plant volatiles in agroecosystems. So as I mentioned before, uh, plants uh, increase the production of volatiles uh, when, um, and also emission of these volatiles when they are being attacked by a herbivore, such as a caterpillar. And this response has been referred to herbivore-induced plant volatiles. These HIPVs play an important role in attracting natural enemies, uh, such as predators, parasitoids, to their prey or host. And in a study showed the importance um, by Kessler and Baldwin in 2001 showed the, the importance of these HIPVs in nature. For they use this um, tritrophic interaction composed of uh, wild tobacco, tobacco hornworm, as the caterpillars, the herbivore, and geocaries uh, palins. And they found that if you apply methyl jasmonate, the volatile derivative of malic acid to those plants, you reduce the survival of manduca sexta, the, the tobacco hornworm. Also, they found that by applying uh, three volatiles, cis hexanol, linalol, and bergamotin to the plants, you increase the attraction of the geocaries uh, that increases predation on those plants and thus reduces the survival of the herbivore on those plants. So my question was, and also other colleagues have asked the same question is, if it happens in nature, can we manipulate this behavior to increase natural attraction uh, to enhance biological control in agroecosystems? So in order for this to happen, there has to be three criteria that have to be met. The first criteria is that the HIPVs need to attract the natural enemies, of course. So you have to demonstrate that the natural enemies are responding to these uh, volatiles. The second criteria needs to, uh, is that this attraction should reduce the pest population. So you have to have uh, an effect on ecosystem function. And finally, this reduction of pet population should cascade to a reduction in, um, in damage, crop damage, and also increase in crop yield. So we have been doing a search through the literature and we found uh, several studies by now that have tested the attraction of natural enemies to these HIPVs. So we found at least 43 studies that have looked into this um, attraction in under field conditions. But much less of these studies, only 13 of them have looked at the criteria number two, whether if you attract them, you actually have an impact on the pest population. And much, much lower number, only three of them have looked at whether this has an effect on the plant whether uh, by attracting these 
uh, natural enemies, you provide an ecosystem service, whether there's an increase in yield or a decrease in the damage. So um, one HIPV that has received great attention in this, all these studies is methyl salicylate. Uh, this uh, compound is emitted by leaves and flowers of many different plants and is commonly induced by insects from different feeding habits. Uh, this compound also induces volatile emissions from neighboring plants. So it can activate uh, plant defenses, not just on, um, by attracting the, the natural enemies, but also inducing uh, uh, defenses on, on the plants that are being exposed to this volatile. But what is important is that this uh, volatile is now commercially available. So growers, farmers can buy these lures in order to increase natural enemy activity in their farms. And this, um, this product is called Predalure. So in a, a collaboration with Ian Kaplan from Purdue University, we conducted a meta-analysis uh, to evaluate the magnitude of natural enemy response to methyl salicylate in the field. Uh, we collected 18 experiments in 14 publications that resulted in 91 studies. And in general, what we found that was that natural enemies are attracted to methyl salicylate, and there was no difference in the attraction uh, between predators and parasitoids, or the attraction of different taxa, natural enemy taxa, to um, this uh, methyl salicylate. So in general, um, this shows that natural enemies are attracted to this volatile. So in an early study, uh, we found that lady beetles, uh, lace wings, and surface are attracted to predalure, but this study was done in a short period of time in cranberries. So um, to address the three criteria that I have, I asked, does uh, HIPVs provide season long, long-term uh, predator attraction in cranberries or in agroecosystems? Um, do HIPVs increase ecosystem function? So uh, by attracting them, does it, this reduce uh, pest populations? And do HIPVs increase ecosystem services? Do they, uh, can we attract them and benefit the plant? So to address the, the first criteria, uh, we tested if attraction of natural enemies to predalure was reliable over time. For this, we conducted a study in cranberries where we had traps, uh, sticky traps that you can see here, yellow sticky traps that were baited with the predalure or unbaited traps within the same bed. And then we counted the number of predators on those traps throughout the season for two consecutive years. So what we found was the surfeit flies are highly attracted to predalure, especially uh, during bloom. And this attraction was consistent uh, for those two years that we did the study. We also found that lady beetles were attracted to predalure, but only in one of the sampling dates, as you can see in the first year. And there was no effect on the second year. And these inconsistencies could be explained by the differences in the species composition uh, between one year and the other year. Uh, so these uh, results indicate that we can attract predators in cranberries using these HIPVs. However, it is important to know if this attraction leads to an increase in predation, our second criteria. So to test this, uh, we conducted a study where we placed sentinel egg masses of the European corn borer, as you can see here. And we left, uh, we had two stations. We had a station with no predalure and one station with the predalure within the same cranberry bed. And we left those eggs for one or two days in the field and then <laughs> the, the eggs that were remaining on those egg masses. And we did this 
uh, several times during the, the, the field season for two consecutive years. And what we found in the first year is that at the beginning of the year, we didn't see a difference in predation, but later in the season, the eggs that were uh, near those predators had higher predation than the eggs that were not, that, that didn't have the predator. And this was consistent in the second year. We, uh, we were able to see higher predation in those, on those eggs that were uh, in the uh, stations with the predator. And we found that on average, the percent predation in the first year was about 3% higher uh, when near the predator. And this difference increased by to 7% in the second year. So to confirm this, uh, we also did uh, these video recordings to observe who was responsible for these differences in predation. So we set up these video cameras and recorded the visitation of predators to uh, sentinel eggs that had uh, predalure near them and also without the, the predalure. So in total, uh, we recorded for two consecutive days for eight times throughout the season and for a total of 576 hours of recording. So here you can see the cameras pointing at the predator with the sentinel eggs and also the sentinel eggs that we used. So um, in total, we recorded 75 predator visits and 52% of those were by lady beetles. And the majority of them, 72%, were to eggs that were near the predator. And here you can see one of the recordings of the lady beetle uh, visiting and feeding on those eggs. So these resulted in more than double the amount of predation of eggs that were near this predator. But the ultimate question is whether um, these HIPVs, the use of HIPVs, can benefit the crop by reducing damage, herbivore damage, and increasing its yield, our criteria number three. And a big concern is uh, that has been raised, and you might be thinking about this also, uh, by colleagues like uh, Ian Kaplan and others, is whether the use of HIPVs in attracting would attract natural enemies to areas where the prey or host are absent, which could disrupt biological control. So a strategy that could prevent these negative effects is by combining HIPVs with companion plants in an attract and reward scenario, where HIPVs are used to attract the natural enemies and companion plants are used as rewards by providing supplemental food in the form of pollen, nectar, or alternative prey. So um, in collaboration with a university in Brazil, we conducted a study to test this concept. And we used a system that consisted of bean plants, uh, methyl salicylate, coriander, and we looked at the effects on the herbivores and also on the natural enemies. So we wanted to see whether this attract and reward affected ecosystem extraction, uh, structure, like would they attract more natural enemies? Would it affect ecosystem function? Would that increase in predation? And whether it has uh, an effect on ecosystem services by uh, increasing yield or reducing damage. So these studies were done by my former uh, PhD student, Giordano Salamanca. Uh, they were done in Brazil. And he had, um, it was replicated plots that had uh, four treatments in each plot. So there were a total of uh, seven blocks and this was replicated in two years.
So here you can see each of the, the blocks with the four different treatments. And within each of these uh, blocks, uh, we had a control treatment with no methyl salicylate or coriander. We had the coriander only treatment, uh, the methyl salicylate alone, and the attract and reward treatment. Uh, we sampled the number of predators that visited those treatments. And what we found was that uh, lady beetles were more attracted to the treatment with the coriander. Surfits were more attracted to all the manipulative treatments. And uh, predatory sting bugs were also attracted to all the manipulative treatments. We also did a visual inspection to look at herbivore abundance. And also we looked at predation rate of sentinel aphids, frozen aphids that we placed in these cardboards to look at um, uh, predation. So what we found was that the number of spider mites was lower in our uh, manipulative treatments, but there was no effect on herbivorous uh, phytophagous sting bugs or chrysomelids. But we saw that our attract and reward treatment had higher predation of aphids. But again, our ultimate goal was to see whether this had an effect on the plant uh, damage and yield. So we, uh, we looked at both damage and also measured crop biomass and yield in these uh, uh, plots. And also uh, Giordano measured the mass of the pods um, and the, and the number of pods and seeds um, in each of the, the plants. And um, also measure crop biomass. And what uh, he found was that there was a decrease in damage uh, by the spider mites on the plants that had all the manipulative treatments. However, the crop biomass was not influenced. And when we looked at the number of pods and seeds, there was also no difference across the, the, the treatments. And there was no difference on the, uh, the weights of the pods or the weights of the seeds. So to conclude, we were, were found that HIPVs can enhance ecosystem structure, either when uh, applied alone or in combination with companion plants. So they, they seem to attract different predators. The attraction of these uh, predators could lead to reduction of pest populations. However, we found mixed results for, uh, on whether they can provide an ecosystem service. We found some reduction of uh, crop damage, but we did not see an increase in yield. So briefly, I'm going to go over uh, my second act which is um, new sources of, uh, of uh, supplemental foods for natural enemies in agroecosystems. And we know that these companion plants can provide supplementary foods for natural enemies in the form of pollen, extrafloral nectaries, and also floral nectars. But in addition, plants provide droplets known as cutation. And these secretions are produced uh, along the edges, as you can see here, of the leaves. And previous studies have considered this mutation as a water source for insects. So here you can see the mutation in a close-up. But there's more that, to this than just water. These are uh, uh, fluids that are from the xylem and also from the phloem that can be composed of uh, nutrients that um, can be used by the insects. And they are um, excreted by these uh, specialized pores. So we asked, um, uh, when is mutation present and it, uh, in what quantity? And what are the insects that are visiting uh, these mutation droplets? And whether they provide an increase in the fitness of these insects that are feeding on them. So these studies were done by my postdoc, 
Pablo Urbaneja Bernat in Blueberries. Uh, to answer the first question, uh, he, um, he marked uh, uh, blueberry bushes in two fields and monitored the amount of glutation production for 12 weeks throughout the day. So they, uh, he measured like during the morning, midday, and in the evening. So he labeled four within each bush, he labeled uh, four branches and uh, two were on the top and two were on the bottom. And within the, the, each uh, leaf, he counted the number of leaves that had glutation and also the number of uh, droplets per leaf. And also, as I mentioned, he counted the number of insects that were visiting those droplets. So this graph uh, shows the number of leaves with glutation throughout the season at different times of the day. And uh, one thing that was very interesting, uh, an interesting finding was that these droplets are present throughout the, the season and uh, were higher during the time of active plant growth. So during, uh, as you can see here, they were higher during shoot expansion and also were higher during the midday when natural enemies are present. So here you, it shows the average number of leaves with mutation being higher during the midday. So he also counted the number of mutation droplets per leaf. And on average, you find from one to three uh, droplets per leaf throughout the entire season. So this indicates that these uh, glutation droplets are fairly reliable food sources for insects throughout the season and throughout the day. So he, as I mentioned, he also looked at who's feeding on those uh, droplets and he found several insects from over 12 taxa that were actually visiting these droplets. Uh, mainly there were flies, uh, for example, drosophil uh, drosophila flies, and also predators like uh, lace wings that were feeding on those, uh, on those droplets and also several parasitoids. So our question was, what was the benefit of feeding in these droplets? Does this increase the fitness of these insects that feed on, the, on um, these droplets? So we conducted studies using a herbivore Drosophila suzukii, a drosophilid, a, a parasitoid of aphids, Aphidius ervi, and a predator, a generalist predator, um, like this lacewing, Chrysoperla uh, rufilabris. So first we looked at uh, longevity. So we fed uh, these uh, three species with um, five different diets, water only, degutation, sugar, protein, and also sugar and protein. So we apply them to this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, pieces of uh, paraffin, and they were fed to the insects in these vials. So for the uh, Drosophila suzukii, we found that uh, flies, female flies, survive better when fed on glutation and sugar. This was also the case for the males. And we found similar results for the parasitoid. You can see that uh, when they were fed on glutation and, and, and sugar, the, their survival was better. And this was the same for males and females. Similar results were found for, uh, for uh, the lace wings. Uh, you can see that um, when fed glutation, sugar, and a mixture of sugar and protein, the survival was better for females and also for males. We also looked at the egg load. So, um, so Pablo dissected a lot of uh, females and, and counted the number of eggs when they were fed on the same five diets and of the same three species uh, of insects. Um, and he counted the eggs at three intervals, one day after feeding on the diet, three days, and seven days after feeding on those diets. 
And these are the results for um, spotted wind drosophila. You can see that even on the, after feeding for one day, you start to see a separation where they were doing better on uh, having more eggs on the glutation diet and also on the mixture between uh, with uh, sugar and protein. And there was a further separation on day three where glutation had the highest number of egg load. And also by seven days where sugar and protein and the glutation had the highest number of eggs. Uh, we did the same for the parasitoid. You can see by, by day three, you start to see a separation where uh, glutation and protein uh, uh, plus sugar had the highest number of eggs. And this was consistent also by day seven. The same for the predator. You start to see some separation after one day. After three days, you start to see that there was more eggs uh, on um, uh, females that fed the glutation, but also the sugar and protein. And uh, this is was consistent by day seven. So what we are finding, this was a, the first study that shows that glutation is a nutrient rich food source for insects. That glutation is more reliable, looks to be more reliable source for um, these insects compared to nectar and pollen that can be uh, present only during a short period of time during the season. We are also showing that insects from different taxa and feeding gills of, uh, visit these uh, glutation droplets. And by feeding on these glutation droplets, it increases their survival and egg load. So to conclude my, my seminar, I'm going to give you some take home messages um, that we have learned from these studies. First, we, we are learning that Yes, synthetic HIPVs can be used to manipulate natural enemies in agroecosystems. How consistent this is uh, needs to be further studied. Uh, we know that uh, different, uh, the response can vary among different crops, but we know that, uh, we, that there's this possibility that we can use these HIPVs to manipulate uh, natural enemy behavior. But as I mentioned, additional strategies will be needed uh, to, uh, to provide them with some food source so they are not um, left without um, any food when you attract them to those agroecosystems. So for example, if you provide them with these companion plants it might be better, a better strategy than just providing, uh, just applying these HIPVs alone. So some of the remaining questions is to study more these multiple strategies to better uh, manipulate natural enemy behavior in agroecosystems. Uh, I have a strong feeling that uh, using more than one strategy is better than just using one. One of the, the studies that we are starting uh, this summer will be to look at how landscape features influence these attraction of natural enemies to these HIPVs. So I'm, uh, here I'm showing you something that uh, I'm working right now uh, that we will, where we will be placing these um, methyl salicylate lures throughout one of the, the largest farms uh, in the world, uh, the largest farm definitely in, in New Jersey um, that, um, that has different uh, landscape features. And we're going to look at the attraction of surfeits uh, on um, the number of surfeits on each of these traps. And the ultimate question is, are farmers going to be willing to adopt any of these strategies to manipulate natural enemy behavior? So with that, I want to thank you. I, especially, I want to thank my lab. Um, there's a, a lot of people involved in all this work. Um, especially uh, Giordano Salamanca, who you can see here, uh, who did uh, a lot of the study on the studies on HIPVs, and Pablo Vaneja Bernat, who did uh, the studies on mutation.
So hopefully right now, Pablo is in, in Spain. Hopefully he'll come back soon so he can continue his work uh, with uh, Gutation this year. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Cesar. That's an excellent uh, presentation. Thank any you. Any questions Chief. for Cesar? Yeah, I have a question. It's kind of a multifaceted question. So this one was about uh, Gutation. And so, if I'm correct, gutation is supposed to be mostly based with like sugar and potassium as like the components that make it up. So like the question for me is why did you choose protein to be included as part of the diet when you were using it for the flies and the lace wings and the parasitoids? And also, do you think that the nymphal diet affects the effects of these particular, like which diet they were going to be like, which ones are gonna be more successful depending on what diet you're gonna feed them later on. So like uh, my thought was lace wing was just as successful being fed with protein, sugar and gutation. However, you didn't see that same effect with uh, as much of an effect with that with the parasitoids as well as the um, uh, flies. And then I thought, so lace wings are predaceous as nymphs. Do you think that that affects it? So like, what if you did the same kind of effect if you did it with like lady beetles? Do you think you'd see that protein for them would be more of a successful component to it? Uh, thank you, Cassia, for, for the question. I think, um, yeah, they, there's, um, it would be good like to test other insects maybe uh, and see how, how it compares with um, how they perform with these different diets. Uh, what we found, and I didn't show here, but it's in the paper that we published, is that uh, when we analyzed the composition of the glutation, we found that it's composed of uh, sucre, it has carbohydrates like sucrose and also has uh, proteins. So it does contain proteins. You would expect like, you know, if it's a fluid, uh, a flowing fluid that would contain carbohydrates. We were surprised to see uh, um, proteins, but also you would expect, expect some nitrogen, um, uh, you know, moving through, through the, um, through the phloem. Um, so, um, so yeah, so the composition, um, uh, that was something uh, that other uh, researchers have reported also that, uh, you know, the, in other crops, um, they also found uh, carbohydrates and proteins, the levels uh, across crops varies widely. Uh, so the composition can, can, you know, where you're feeding, what crop you're feeding, what could affect your, your, um, your performance, your fitness. And that's something that actually um, we were asked in the paper, like how broad this is, because we only looked at one crop, but um, that's something that uh, Pablo and I have been discussing and hopefully he can continue with that uh, in the future, like to look at, you know, other crops, do they also provide the same benefit uh, to the insects? Um, because what the idea to me is that uh, you can use these plants as companion plants. If you find some plants that provide them with a good food source, because that's what you're looking at. You're looking for this, if you're going to apply this attract and reward strategy, you want to provide them with, with plants that are rich in nutrients to them. Um, so one of the, these nutrients can be through discutation. Um, your second question, I mean, it's a good one. I, again, you know, we need to look at more insects. Um, definitely like having the, 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 as you would expect, the protein in the diet help them to produce more eggs, which is what you would expect. And just having the sugar in the diet help them to live longer, which is what you would expect. But, um, but we only looked at those three species. So we don't know, you know, what would be the benefit on lady beetles, for example. If you took a, if you could like take a guess, a stab in the dark, what kind of crops uh, would you think would be some of the most nutritious ones out there? Cause I'm like, I'm like thinking in my head, I'm like, Ooh, a grape could be really nutritious cause it's full of sugars. But then I'm like, oh, that's terrible. I mean, it, that can't be a companion plant because it's extremely difficult to grow. I, I don't know. I, uh, I mean, he, um, I have to look at the data because he, in the paper, he did look at the published, um, the, the, what, the published papers and the composition. So um, that was something that the, the, the editor-in-chief asked us to do. 
uh, to make it broader in impact. So we do have in the paper, and I don't remember which plants were the ones that were richer in, in, uh, in uh, nutrients, um, but, um, but I can tell you, like, since we published the paper, a lot of uh, colleagues came to me and said, hey, yes, I, I saw those droplets in my plants, and I never, I was wondering, like, what they would do to the insects. So a lot of people, like, have said, like, not just cultivated plants, but also wild plants produce this quotation. So, so it would be good like to have a better sense of, you know, uh, how good they are for insects. Yeah, every time I see quotation now, I always think about Pablo's uh, presentation last year. I'm like, I know what these are. <laughs> yes, I didn't know, to tell the truth, I didn't know what they were either. Dina. Okay, so um, really great presentation, really fun, really interesting to see like the, the full life history of, uh, of a research project. Uh, but one, one thing in terms of your sort of mildly disappointing results uh, of the effects of these predators is that you have a cultivated plant. Shouldn't you be producing cultivated um, predators? Shouldn't you be adding predators, like grow them and, uh, and add them? Uh, so the, yes. So the idea, so it depends on what strategy you're using, but you're right. Like it could be, uh, conservation biological control that you're targeting, which is just, you know, um, using the, the, the existing natural enemies to enhance biological control by pulling them from uh, natural habitat, which is what, what a lot of interest has been. Like, you know, uh, if you have more diversified uh, landscapes, you would uh, expect more natural enemies. Absolutely. But the question has always been, do would they move to your crop? Are they interested in like going into your crop? So should we help them? So that's one question. That's that's kind of like where my question has been throughout these years. But you're right. Like also, you could release the natural enemies mm -hmm. and see whether they stay longer, uh, like more augmentative biological control. And Ian Kaplan did a study on that, and he showed that yes, they it tends to retain them longer. Uh, he did a mark release a study where he showed that actually if you release them, they will stay. So you can, yeah, you can do, bo do both. So what's the, what's the drawback? Is it very expensive or hard to grow these uh, predators? I mean, we're, we're growing mosquitoes. That's kind of the, the new thing. So I was curious to see how that's yeah. translating to other fields. Well, there's predators, like a, a lot of the natural enemies that, mm -hmm. that you can use like for augmentative control, biological control, you can buy them and release them. Huh. So they are commercially available. Um, the question to me is that how consistent these effects are in different crops. What we are finding is that the, the response of the natural enemy to a specific HIPV depends on the crop that you're using. So uh, what natural enemy you're targeting is going to depend on what crop you're working on. Uh, not the responses vary to, uh, and I think the reason why we assume this happens is because the plants are also producing HIPVs. They are producing their own volatiles. So the background, the smell of the background is going to influence how a strong response you get from the natural enemy. Um, so we get, I, I believe that we get a strong response of surfaces to methyl salicylate in cranberries because cranberries don't produce that much methyl salicylate. So, um, and methyl salicylate is emitted by flowers. So they are looking for a flower source, a, a source of nectar or, or pollen. And what we're doing is we're, we're creating this big flower telling them, hey, we're here, come here. And that's what, and they, they chase you. Like if you grab one of these lures, you'll see the, the, the surface like, flying around you, but depends oh, on- The daughter has a question. Yes. So Cesar, uh, we have a question from the chat um, asking if you could describe the landscape features at the large farm at the end of, the, of your presentation that you'll be looking at. Yes, I, I was thinking about that. Like, um, you know, uh, the only thing, the problem that I had was that that's the map that the grower gave me, which, you know, doesn't have the landscape features on it. Oh. So I just, um, I, was, I was just using the map to like 
plot, you know, which, uh, but it varies widely because there's some areas that are surrounded by, by forest within that same farm. And there's some areas where uh, you're next to the, the road. Um, there's areas that there's, they are next to just a, a, a water source, like a, a lake or a pond. Uh, there's areas that, um, that are just next to other beds. So the, the landscape, uh, even within that, that farm is very large. Even is, it a, is it a big blueberry farm in Southern New Jersey? That um, the one that we are that I showed is a cranberry farm. Ah, in southern New Jersey. Yes, yes, yes. It's the, our neighbor. Is uh, oh, okay. Is the Haynes farm? Is the pine uh, pinelands? Yes, and uh, the the reason why I, I want to do this there is also they have a very good record on what they are they do um, throughout. They have you know what uh, insecticides they are using, which would be very helpful to me. Um, and also they have good records on, on yield for each of the beds. So I can relate, you know, the, the number of surfeits that I catch on the, on the straps with um, the history of, <clears throat> of pesticides and also yield. Thanks. Cesar, um, very, very interesting. As you know, I've been totally fascinated by this tritrophic stuff since uh, since before you came to Rutgers, and I'm so glad you're here and you've done so well. I think um, in answer to Kasha's question, you may have answered my question, but I have a comment, uh, and that is the contents of gutation. Um, and uh, it, it sounds like it's simpler than I thought it was. There aren't things like amino acids or um, uh, other uh, non-volatile small molecules. Is that correct? Well, we didn't look for them, Bob, and that's exactly, that's fascinating because I'm very interested. One of the things that I discussed with Pablo is looking at volatiles because yeah. are they emitting volatiles that are attracting the, the natural enemies? I can, it's just a, is it just a visual cue that they are using or there's also involvement of, um, because with nectar, it has been found that nectar produces volatiles that can yes. attract. Right. And also these volatiles can be influenced by uh, microbes in- Exactly, uh, right. Yes. Quad, so quad, quadritrophic. <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, yeah. me, there's a, it opens a lot of questions. And then there, um, in the middle of the talk, there's a couple of slides. If you could scroll back from uh, bef to before the Cotation series started, and uh, um, there, there are some, um, there's, there, there are a couple of slides where you have uh, three different times of day, morning, one o'clock, and I think 6 p.m. And the reason I'm asking, I'm raising it is because I think, I think the, the, one of those slides was mislabeled. It's, the solid line is 1 p.m., but you had it as the 6 p.m. Um, sampling, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, I just I caught that quickly as it was going by, so I just go back and go, go back and have a look at that slide and make. Yes, sure. I, I will. Like uh, I double I actually added that recently, so maybe it was my mistake. Um, I, I added that label, but the point that I was trying to make that that Pablo found that was that in the middle of the day, which was surprising to me. To me, in the middle of the day, they were producing more gutation. I thought more gutation happened at night during the evening. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Higher humidity, relatively exactly, and also the content of gutation must change over from time of day and also from uh, seasonal effects, right? Going forward as the as the plant develops, I would so, imagine because um, I, I would I would I would advocate uh, unpacking the gutation story a little bit more, which it sounds like you're planning to do, which is good. One thing that uh, is clear um, is that as the the the, the, the leaves senesce, the amount of gutation drops. Sure. It's, it's just on the, on the younger leaves that you start to see more gutation. And you're right. We see it when, when it's humid. Like I see it a lot in the greenhouse. Sure. It's very common in the greenhouse because of that humidity. Like, um, so, um, Although that might be more accumulation of it where it's visible than production of it. Yes, yes. It could be that... Um, they were produced the day before, you know, overnight, and we're just counting, yes. 
Why would you think that there's a peak in the gutation in June with one of the graphs, like based off of what you guys were talking about? Like that, I thought that was really interesting because yeah. it doesn't really go off of, I would have assumed it would have been either early in the spring since you just said it was, you know, young foliage, but it was in June, it's, it's hot in June. And then I was like, okay, maybe in July, they're trying to cool themselves off. But then I was like, then July should have been the peak, not June being the peak. So why do you think that June is such a gutation? Well, because the, plant, uh, the blueberries have, that put new growth at different times of the year. So June is when they start to put like the, the new growth also uh, during the season. That's when growers also fertilize. And also that's when aphids show up uh, because they like those new growth. Um, so that coincided with more leaves having the gutation, which makes sense because they are, yeah, they are putting new growth um, during that time. Thank you, Cesar. I think uh, we have to end. Uh, if you have more questions, you can send the Cesar email. Excellent presentation. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Very really nice, Cesar. Thank you. Uh, Chen Yu, are we, are we staying with the students? Yeah, we, the students yes. will stay. Okay, good.